The first thing to, to consider is that it was marginal land. Similar to places like the Sleeve Octis and other places like these, where you had marginal land, you actually find that uh, the history runs out, if you like, in those places. People cannot live in marginal areas. Uh, they're usually hard places to work and hard places to live in. So eventually, when uh, t times are ripe, uh, people move again. And that's really what happened to the Callows. Standing here on the uh, top of the Bordenamona Railway Bridge, built here in 1966. Um, and uh, we're actually standing above what was the Grand Canal, the Balna Slow extension of the Grand Canal. When you look at the, the Arden Survey map, what you clearly see is that the callows, the extended callows, are held between two water bodies. The Grand Canal on the western edge and the River Shannon on the eastern edge. So in every sense, it becomes a large island. And of course, uh, as far as settlement is concerned, uh, this is also this, if you like, this insular nature occurs where you have this huge settlement in that uh, body of land, that sort of artificial island in there in the Callows. It was church lands. Under uh, the, the regulation within church land, it was possible to actually set or to lease bog lands, and that's what it was. So the son leased about a thousand acres of bog land from the father or from the church, and he had that drainage. There was a big drainage policy taking place at that stage. He had the lands drained. We don't have accurate accounts for when people first settled in the Callows, but we know that it was around 1810, 18, well, maybe slightly, you know, around that period that the first uh, uh, surveys were beginning to take place to drain the bogs and create uh, farms in bogland. It was a new, new idea that was being brought out uh, by the agricultural societies that for the, for the landlords to, to turn this wasteland into good land. It, 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 in many ways, it was a failed experiment because, it, you know, it, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't control nature. It was, a, it was an expensive way of creating farms. A lot of it has gone wild and gone back, as they say, in, in the vernacular. But it's gone back because there are no longer people farming as they did. In the past, every drain and every ditch that was there had to be dealt with. It was essential to keep that place uh, drained and managed and worked. Well, the Shannon, the Shannon offered a lot to the people. Both the Shannon and the canal offered a lot to the people of the Callows because uh, it was a mode of transport. It was, it was, it was a routeway. Going back to prehistoric times, going back to medieval times, the Shannon was the north-south uh, access route through the country. But it did the same, uh, we say, during the 19th and early 20th century, where people could, uh, with their boat, could go up as far as Shannon Bridge, could go down as far as uh, Shannon Harbour, go across the Shannon Harbour, go down as far as Banner. Shopping, going for a pint, whatever you have going across to, to Cayleys and stuff like that. The people they had absolutely no problem in uh, negotiating the Shannon. It was, it was another conjure, it was another routeway. In summertime, they had very rich meadowlands and that because of the flooding of the Shannon, the silting of the, the, the callows and that. In that instance, the, the Shannon, if you like, provided. But in the wintertime, the Shannon was actually treading on their doorstep. They, you know, they were living under the threat of uh, annual flood. We're west of the Shannon. We're about, we're about 500 metres. There or thereabouts, about half a kilometre from the Shannon here uh, at this point. But of course, in the winter when the Shannon floods, the Shannon would be just within 100 yards or 100 metres of here. There are no houses left standing in the Callas with the exception of this one. And uh, in fact, this one was actually in ruins up until about 15 years ago when Brendan, Tommy, both passed on now, and Willie Spellman three of the sons of this house decided to uh, re-roof it and just push it back again, just to have something in the callows that represented what the houses might have looked like. So what would happen in the wintertime, in a lot of cases, people would simply uh, lift their fireplaces or lift the, the fire up off the floor. They'd have it on a piece of uh, tin or a piece of metal. Uh, sometimes they'd lift the bed up on timber. They might have planks on the floor and they'd actually literally be getting out of, of, of bed into the water. A lot of them would actually have their boat tied at the door because the water was in the house and around the house. There's probably 40 or 50 households in all that we're dealing with. And nothing, only a few stones survive of any of them. A few of the shells survive, but the majority have disappeared. Some have just simply fallen into the uh, earth itself. And more have been removed for repairing roads and things like that. 
So really this is, uh, if you like, it's, it's, it's a legacy of the past. Eventually, when the likes of Butsons and Trenches and the Strangers over on the Offaly side, when those estates collapsed, when eventually the, the families died out, uh, the Land Commission stepped in, they bought the estates, and they actually divided them up, creating new farms for all of the, the people that lived in the Callas. So it wasn't really until the 1950s that the people started to move. Some other families had come up before that, uh, and some families didn't come up till about 1961, there or thereabouts, a few of the last families. I suppose one of the reasons that I have um, taken such an interest in the Callas and started to research the place is that, well, first of all, my own people came out of it. So you have to be inspired by that. And as a child, I walked around that place, finding all sorts of little things, objects and bits of broken cups and pottery and melted bottles where the bog would have gone on fire and stuff like that that intrigued me. I'm actually working on the document at the moment. I have quite a bit of work done on it. I have a quite, a, quite a bit of work to do, but I'm hoping to uh, publish a book on this. It was only there for a short period of time, but it has a huge uh, cultural legacy left behind. Um, and I think that if I can do anything, what I should be doing is actually leaving that legacy as I have received it for the next generation.